Hi, my name is Roland and welcome to the Vectrex Rolly Show. Thanks for joining me again. Sit back, relax. This video here is a Commodore 128D special. That computer came out at the end of the 8-bit home computer era in 1987. And what I like is that I can play some good old Commodore C64 home computer games with that thing and it looks like an old desktop PC. If you have seen one of my other home computer special videos like for the Commodore Amiga 500, Sinclair ZX80, ZX Spectrum, TR99 for example, or my video about the Commodore VIC-20, you already know what to expect from this video here. And if you are interested in old home computers, I will link to those, go and check them out. The 128D version I got here is the later European 128 DCR version, to be more specific, the desktop cost reduced model and usually I can tell you a bit more about those machines than just reading some Wikipedia articles to you while showing you some stone photo and video content from the web, but still I will not be able to tell you all I know here, so I try to focus on the most important things. I will show you the computer, I will tell you what modifications I did, I will show you the different video cables and also a few programs. If you really want to use that C128 DCR computer on a daily base with a modern flash drive replacement, you need to do some changes. But before I show you that, I quickly want to show you some other Commodore machines that came out before this computer here. Commodore did produce several different home computers back in the 1980s, like the VIC-20 here, the first successful gaming machine from Commodore with color graphics. Really love that computer, you also can watch that on my channel and even in 3D if you want. It would take too much time now to tell you about the whole Commodore history, I only want to give you a quick overview about machines that came out before the C128. Depending on your age, you might have heard about the Commodore C64. There were several models available and you can get thousands of nice old-school 8-bit games for that computer. And there are many new homebrew games and arcade ports even developed today. You know, it is really impressive what developers can do with such old hardware. In case you are one of my younger viewers and you don't feel any nostalgia for a C64, but you still want to try some of the games, there are many great emulators available. And today you also can get modern FPGA versions of the C64. But for me personally, I always prefer the real thing. I love the nostalgia around old home computers. I want to touch the keyboard. And I also like how old computers look and smell. Anyway, before we continue, maybe I show you also the SX64, which is the coolest Commodore 8-bit home computer ever made, in my personal opinion. This was a portable version of the C64 with a built-in color CRT monitor. Very interesting machine, but usually you need to do some repair and renovation work. Often the integrated circuits die from heat. I also had to replace one disk controller chip in my computer here when I got it. And I put also a heat sink on top of it. So, as I own that cool SX64 machine, why did I still get a C128 DCR then? The SX64 is just too valuable to use it every day. And I also always wanted a C128 desktop version that looks like a PC. So one at my friend's house back in the days. And the C128 in general is quite interesting from a technical point of view and an absolute disaster from a marketing and product management point of view as a lot of expensive and complicated technical features were implemented that not many people really ever used. But I will come to that later. The first Commodore 128 model came out in 1985. That one had a plastic case and it looked very similar to the later Commodore Amiga 500. Then in 1986 Commodore released a desktop model with a plastic case. You can see that one in action on the channel of a fellow YouTuber, Lactobacillus Prime. But I personally always wanted the latest version C128 DCR, which is a cost-reduced desktop version with a metal case, and my version came out in 1987. 
this was already quite late or already too late for the market as the Amiga 500 came out in the same year and the Amiga was a powerful device from the future compared to the old 8-bit computers. Both the C64 and the C128 just looked like Stone Age tools when you already got an Amiga. If you want to know more about C128 development, I really can recommend a video on the Guru Meditation channel, where they did a short interview with Bill Hurd, who was part of the C128 development team. Really interesting to watch, much more interesting than just listening to some random boring Wikipedia knowledge you can find on some other channels out there. So go and check that out, Bill Hurd shows up there in the second half of the video. So let's have a closer look at my C128 DCR. As I said, I will show you that machine in action later. I will also tell you which kind of restoration work and modifications I did. I will show you how to use the 1541 Ultimate 2, which can get a bit complicated. And I will show you different video cable options and many other things for people that are interested in a C128 DCR. Many things I will mention are also relevant for other Commodore 128 versions including the first standard model. My DCR version here was the last C128 model that came on the market and the main differences to previous versions was that there is more video RAM available for the 18 color mode and it has a faster Commodore 1571 floppy drive built in. The C128 line in general is quite interesting from a technical point of view as you basically get three computers in one and that's what makes a C128 so interesting for home computer enthusiasts like me that are looking for some obscure features to play with. You can start your computer in three different modes, there is the C64 mode, the computer behaves like a good old C64 then, and you can take full advantage of the wide range of available C64 software and hardware. In C128 mode you get access to 128K of memory and you can use a more powerful basic language version than the C64 had and you can even choose between 40 and 80 column video output. And you also could boot up your computer in a third mode, the so called CPM mode which was used for more professional office software like word processing for example and there you could also use the 80 column video output option. Most people used and still use their C128 mainly in C64 mode as they want to play all the great games available and not many companies produced hardware and software for the C128 or CPM mode as they always wanted to reach as many people as possible so most of them focus primarily on the C64. From a marketing perspective, Sinclair had a much better approach when upgrading their 48 kilobyte Sinclair ZX Spectrum to the more advanced 128K Spectrum, so the basic set of features including the graphic modes were identical, you only got a music chip and more memory, so it was quite simple for software developers to release slightly upgraded 128K versions of their existing 48K programs. But at the end of the day it didn't help Sinclair to survive either, but anyway go and watch my Sinclair ZX Spectrum video if you want to know more about that. My C128 DCR version here is a PAL machine made for the German market. If you want to see a US NTC version of my computer here, go to the channel of another fellow YouTuber, Modern Vintage Gamer, he shows his restoration project there. I even got a keyboard with special German characters, I always prefer German keyboard whenever I can get one, especially for my Commodore Amiga computers, so that I don't have to always look for the, all the special characters needed for configuration changes. Talking about the keyboard, when you get the C128 DCR, make sure to get also the keyboard included, as it has a special connector and buying a separate keyboard can get expensive. The front panel and parts of the keyboard are made of plastic, which can get yellow over the years, similar to Commodore Amiga machines. 
It is easy to read through bright those parts in case you know what it is, but usually that does not last forever then. All the rest of the case is made of metal and there are two LEDs, one for power and one for floppy disk drive access, and I really like the slick design of the whole machine. So does that mean this Commodore 128 DCR version is the perfect machine I would recommend to get if you want to play C64 games? No, not really in my opinion. This computer is perfect for home computer fans like me, but there are four main disadvantages in case you are only interested in playing C64 games. First of all, the case and the separate keyboard use a lot of space on your desk and the built-in 1571 drive is not really 100% compatible with all C64 speed enhancer programs. The third issue is that you need to modify your computer first before you can boot from an external floppy or 1541 Ultimate 2 flash drive. Of course, you also could load your games from the internal built-in floppy drive or use only game ROMs and cartridges instead, but still most people want to use more modern flash drive solutions to load programs today. The fourth downside is the biggest one in my personal opinion, you get vertical stripes on your screen when using the 40 color mode, which is also the standard C64 game mode. This is due to the more modern version of the VIC-2 video interface controller chip used in C128 models, and it depends on your TV or monitor how strong that effect will be visible on your screen. You can also get similar issues on later C64 models. Some people try to fix that with certain mods, but not sure if that really helps much. By the way, you don't see any stripes when using the 80 column screen mode, as this one is generated by a completely separate video chip called VDC Video Display Controller. So if any of those issues are a showstopper for you, don't even think about getting that model. Well, if you put in also a cooler fan like I did, you have another disadvantage, your computer makes some noise and sounds like an old PC, but I will talk about it later. In this DCR version you get a 1571 disk drive built in, which is faster than the older 1541 drive from Commodore, but that is more interesting when using your computer in C128 and CPM mode, and the 1571 is not really 100% compatible to speed enhancers written for the 1541, even most C64 games still work. As the 1571 is a double-sided disk drive, I think you can at least use the higher capacity even in C64 mode if you really want, by using some command, which I never really tried out myself. If you want to get a C128 DCR or a 1571 floppy disk drive, there is one important thing for you to know. It is very important to keep a disk in the closed 1571 drive, especially when not using it, otherwise the headlifter spring will break over time. It seems that the previous owner of my computer did know that, as I got my computer with a disk in the drive, and my built-in 1571 still works fine after all the years. You know, I have no issues renovating old computers, replacing caps and things like that, but I absolutely hate repairing disk drives. It is boring, extremely time-consuming, and it always drives me nuts. I use an external modern drive replacement anyway, which you will see later, still I also like that the built-in drive is still fully working. By the way, if you want to see a smart gentleman repairing such old disk drives and other complicated stuff, go and subscribe to my friend Gadget UK. He really has all the patience and knowledge to bring even old disk drives back to life again without destroying them with a hammer or a flamethrower and throwing the parts out of the window, as I usually do. Let's have a quick look now at the back side of the main unit. There you have a power switch, you can plug in expansion cards and C64 game models. You can connect external hardware like additional disk drives and printers. You have a connector for the standard 4K character video mode, you use that one also for C64 games. And you have a separate RGB connector for the 80 column mode. 
you could also connect an old TV via a RF connector, but nobody will do something like that today, I guess. The rotary switch is something I built in as a modification, which I will explain later, and there is also an opening for a cooler fan, which was not built in in this cost-reduced DCR version, but I put one in as an upgrade, as we will also see later. On the right hand side of the main unit we can see the connector for the data recorder, beside that is the keyboard plug, the two joystick ports and two reset buttons. Next let's have a look inside my C128 DCR here and I will show you the enhancements and modifications I built in. This was my restoration project during summer 2017 and it took me quite some time. I usually don't make videos where you see me repairing stuff, one reason is that in my basement I don't have enough space to use both my video equipment also my repair equipment in parallel and it would take too long for me shooting video and do soldering work so I usually only make some photos during repair work to document everything. So let's start first with the built-in power supply, as with all power supplies for old game consoles and home computers, don't trust them when you get them, in case you know what you're doing, have a detailed look first and measure the output voltage before you use them. I've seen for example external Amiga power supplies where the capacitors and other parts were damaged and they would kill your computer. Here in this case my computer was fully working and it was also unmodified, still you have to be very careful with such old hardware. The built-in power supply is a switched mode power supply and similar to old CRT TVs and monitors you have to deal with high voltage and you should not touch that if you are not a trained technician or at least you know what you are doing, that power supply can kill you. I did replace all capacitors in the power supply after cleaning it, those caps are usually the first ones that will die after all the years. With all the switched mode power supplies you need to be careful, some of those need some load at the output before you switch them on and measure the output voltage. I don't want to go into all the technical details here, there are channels out there only focusing on that part, but as I said, don't even think about touching such a power supply if you are not 100% confident that you know in detail what you are doing. The metal case behind the power supply was already prepared for a small fan, but as this is the cost reduced model, Commodore didn't put one in. Does it make sense now to add one? Well, you will get different answers depending on whom you ask. I can tell you that heat, leaking capacitors and wrong DC voltage are the main reasons why old computers will die and those reasons often go hand in hand. So I decided to replace the caps in the computer and also did add a fan as I want to use this machine here on a daily base without worrying too much about heat and I don't really care that my machine now does make some noise similar to an old PC. So basically you can take any standard flat cooler fan that fits in there. I used a 12V DC model and put it between the 12V and 5V DC power lines, which results in 7V DC input for the fan, so my fan doesn't run at full speed, which reduces the noise, but it still runs fast enough to cool down the power supply and also other parts of the mainboard. There are other and more complicated ways to achieve that, like using temperature sensors or speed control models, but I always prefer simple solutions. I strongly recommend to use four silicon fan holders instead of screws. The idea is that the running fan does not directly touch the metal case and this helps again to reduce noise. There is no time here to discuss all the different bearing systems you can find in modern cooler fans, but long story short, if you can afford the additional 10 to 20 bucks, just don't buy super cheap no-name fans from China, usually they will get noisy after a short period of time. Even I used a slightly more expensive Sunon fan running at 7 volts instead of 12 volts and even using the silicone holders you can definitely hear the fan running and it does generate some noise, which is not really a problem for me as it is likely that this will increase the lifespan of my machine. 
So if you want to use your C128 DCR quite often, I do recommend to upgrade your computer with a fan, as the case is already prepared for that, if you will get some more dust into your computer over time. Here you can see a photo of all the dirt on the main PCB when I got it, so I did take everything apart first to wash it, I did not really do much to the 1571 disk drive, I only took it out and used a vacuum cleaner on that one, as it was still working fine. For cleaning the PCB here is a pro tip for you, most of you will already know that you can wash the PCB with water or even soap, and I mean only the main PCB of the computer, not the disk drive of course, I would not wash that. Maybe you would like to put the wet PCB into the summer sun later, so that it dries up much faster, but some of you might not know that there are so called EEPROMs on board, they have a tiny window on top where you can delete the content of the EEPROM with UV light, so you should never ever put such an old home computer board into direct sunlight and also double check if all the protection stickers are still on your EEPROMs after washing the main board. Losing the content of the ROMs on your computer would be an absolute nightmare, even I've seen lists on the web explaining all the different ROM versions for all the different C128 models, I haven't seen any place so far where you can also download a copy of the content for all those ROMs. When cleaning the main board, better be careful, there are tons of proprietary Commodore chips on board that are not easy to get nowadays. I will not explain you all the different chips on the board now, as that would take forever and I find it always a bit boring, but here I show you the two separate graphic chips, one for the 80 column mode using RGB output and one for the 40 column composite video or SVHS component output. You can find them in separate metal boxes on your PCB and the top cover of the shielding boxes also take care about cooling the chips. So I did clean the chips, put in new tiny caps also on that part of the PCB and I put a modern high performance thermal compound on top of the graphic chips. What is also worth mentioning is that the C128 has two CPUs inside, one running at two different speeds, 1 MHz and 2 MHz for the C64 and C128 mode and one separate Z80 processor which is used for the CPM mode only. So this is quite a complex and interesting setup for such a home computer. When replacing the caps I found one capacitor that was actually already leaking, so I was glad that I did recap most parts of my computer before the traces on my PCB got damaged. So those home computers are quite old and need some care, and Commodore did not really use the best and most expensive components available, so you should think about recapping them over time. So finally the PCB was clean and the caps were replaced, what I usually do after that is that I glue some heat sinks on those chips that will get hot, this is very easy to do and also very inexpensive and it will definitely increase the lifetime of those integrated circuits, especially when you use that together with the cooler fan upgrade. Now I want to show you the rotary switch modification I built in, with that I can easily change the drive address of the built-in disk drive, so that I can boot from an external drive instead. That built-in drive has the default address 8, but I want to use a modern external drive replacement in most cases, that one also should use address 8, because that is required for some C64 games and there are many other good reasons which would take too long now to explain in detail. Even I want to use a modern drive replacement, I still want to be able to boot also from the internal 1571 disk drive using address 8 from time to time, so with my switch I can simply change the address of my built-in drive to addresses 8, 9, 10 or 11. Is such a switch absolutely necessary? Well, you could also always use some basic commands to change drive addresses or maybe create some boot disk for that or maybe nowadays there are already better more modern solutions available but I don't know about those. Or you could use something like the EasyFlash 3 card to launch your C64 game ROMs instead of loading them from a disk or modern disk replacement. That's how I currently load games on my SX64 for example, where I have similar address issues with the built-in drive. 
I want to use my good old 1541 Ultimate 2 as an external drive replacement on my computer most of the times, so in that case it is much easier switching the internal drive to address 10 first, using the rotary switch and then using drive addresses 8 and 9 for my external Ultimate drive to emulate two 1541 disk drives. So for this switch mode I had to drill a hole into the case and I put it at the back where I don't immediately see it. Whenever I do mods like that and show it on YouTube, they're always weird and confused people crawling out of the woodwork and they tell you then that you should never do something like that. Still I prefer to use my computers, what is the point buying old computers and never use them? One day you will die and people will come to throw all your crap away. I find it much better to buy such things for a purpose and having fun with it. Anyway, because that switch is on the back, I didn't use a tiny one, but a bigger rotary switch instead, which I can use without looking at the back. I know that the utmost position is disk drive address 8 for my built-in 1571 disk drive, and I can switch it to the addresses 9, 10 and 11 without looking. If you want to do the same mod, I will put a link to a web page in the description text below where it is described how to do that, but not really sure if that mod works exactly the same on an US NTSC machine. On my PCB there were two solder pads which you can cut in half and solder together again later if you want, so Commodore has already foreseen a way to change the internal drive address. There are two of those pads or lines, so depending on the four possible combinations, closed, closed, open, closed and so on, you get one of the four possible drive addresses for your internal 1571 drive. On the web page they recommend to use two pull-down resistors, but for me it worked without those. If you have problems with your setup and the internal drive address is not stable and is changing on its own over time, try to put in also pull-down resistors. The rotary switch I got from eBay, I was looking for a model with two contact rows and four steps and also one that already comes with a knob included. So now I have that switch in my computer and I can use external drives or drive replacements. Before we will switch on the computer again, I want to show you also the bottom side of my metal case. I don't know if that cost reduced version did have rubber feet on the bottom side of the case and if so, how those would look like. You can find many photos and even videos on the web about that computer, but it seems nobody ever showed also the bottom side. There were no rubber feet on my computer and I assumed they got lost over time, so I put four white modern Amiga 500 replacement feet there. They are easy to get, they fit perfectly and I also guessed they would come close to whatever Commodore would have used at that time. So this is quite a long video and I hope you still are watching without falling asleep. We have now a restored, recapped Commodore 128 DCR PAL computer, we upgraded it with a fan and heat sinks for the most important chips and we added even a switch so that we can boot from an external drive for modern drive replacement while still being able to also use the internal 1571 disk drive whenever we want. Before I will show you the modern disk drive replacement, let's have a quick look at the standard behavior of the computer when booting it up. So when we switch on the computer and there is no C64 cartridge plugged in at the back, the computer starts up in Commodore 128 mode and there we can use an enhanced version of BASIC. You can access the built-in disk drive and load programs and those programs also load quite fast. Only problem is that there were not too many specific Commodore 128 titles available. You get a few modern homebrew games and demos and very few classic C64 games. Could also use some enhancements of the Commodore 128 hardware when running in C64 mode, so they can detect the faster CPU for example. In C128 mode you could use either the standard 40 color mode or you can press a key on your keyboard and switch to the more professional 80 column RGB mode if you had the right monitor for that. There are two separate video outputs for 40 and 80 color mode, so you either use two separate monitors or a single one that can handle both. 
The best option would be to use an old original Commodore. CRT monitor can handle both modes, but you can also use more modern LCD TVs or monitors and you can use composite video or component SVHS video for the 40 color mode and you can get even special video cables and converters for the 80 color mode. 80 color mode does not mean text only, you also get 64 kilobytes graphics memory in the DCR model for enhanced graphic possibilities, which only very few programs and few modern demos really used. Most people used and still use their Commodore 128 computers in C64 mode, and in that mode you can only use 40 color mode. Basically, there are three ways to switch to C64 mode. You either plug in any C64 card at the back of the computer and switch it on, or you can hold down the Commodore key when booting, or the third option is to type in the command Go64. Once you are in C64 mode, you can play your C64 games as usual. As I already told you, there are a few games that can use some of the C128 enhancements. Next, let's have a look at the external drive replacement I'm using for my project here. This is the 1541 Ultimate 2. On the left side is the more modern plus version. On the right side, the older model that I use for my computer now. So, what is the 1541 Ultimate 2, just in case you never heard about that? It is an accurate emulation of two Commodore 1541 disk drives plus several additional features like C64 cartridge emulation, tape emulation, RAM expansion and much more. It is quite expensive compared to some other solutions, but it has many great features built in. The accurate disk emulation might also be a disadvantage in the few cases you want to use it in C128 or CPM mode, as the 1541 drive was painfully slow in general. Most C64 users use certain tricks and tools to enhance speed. There is even a story about that, so some Commodore engineer wanted to improve disk speed when designing the C64, but unfortunately they removed some of the necessary traces from the PCB at the production factory, which made the whole disk access slow again. The 1541 disk drive was also super expensive back in the days, as they put a whole separate computer into the thing for all the control logic, so it was really annoying that it was not only expensive, but also super slow. There are several other modern disk drive replacements on the market, and I guess you can get most of them also working on the C128 DCR, like the SD2IC for example, which I always have plugged in in my VIC-20 to test the latest homebrew software for that machine. As I got the newer 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus, I wanted to give my older Ultimate a new purpose. Both the Plus and Non-Plus version have the same basic functionality, but the Plus has some features already built in, like a speaker for disk drive sound emulation or an Ethernet plug. So on the older Non-Plus model, you need to use external add-ons for that, which takes a bit more space around the Ultimate, and all of that can be hidden behind the desktop case. The Ultimate did not work immediately out of the box on my C128 version. I had to change some configuration settings first, which I found on a very helpful web blog, and I will put a link for that in the description text below. So I changed some settings, after that, disk image access just worked fine. I wanted to use most of the features of my Ultimate and I like that you can use tape images and yes, I know, you can find games also as disk and ROM versions and you can even convert image types, but still I enjoy also to load a tape image. Using the Ultimate Tape Adapter gets a bit complicated on the DCR computer. There is a tape plug, but you need to cut off the left and right side of your plug first so that you can put it in and also you need to replace the ribbon cable with a longer one. On the newer Ultimate 2 Plus, some kind of USB cable is used for the tape adapter instead, which makes things easier. Still, I didn't want to cut anything on the adapter of my new great looking Ultimate 2 Plus version. So as the non-plus Ultimate does not have a speaker built in, I have to use a tiny external speaker for disk sound emulation. I find it useful to get some audio feedback so that I know that the loading process is still ongoing and it is also quite funny that your modern drive replacement sounds like an old disk drive. 
The tiny speaker does have a stereo plug, but unfortunately only one of the two signals is used, so you cannot use the same speaker for both disc sound emulation and tape sound feedback at the same time. I also got this USB LAN adapter from Deal Extreme a long time ago, as the Nonplus Ultimate does not have an Ethernet plug built in. With that network connection you can put your games and programs on the SD card of the Ultimate without climbing behind your desktop computer, so that's really very convenient. So how does the Ultimate work now on my desktop C128? You put all your programs, disk images, ROM images and tape images on the Ultimate and you press a button and the special menu shows up to select the file you want to load. The easiest way for the start is to switch the built-in drive to address 10 first and use addresses 8 and 9 for the Ultimate. It is also important to know that the screen menu for loading on the Ultimate only works in 40 column mode and not in 80 column video mode. If you want to use your C128 in C64 mode most of the time, it is a good idea to select any of the C64 cards built in in your Ultimate like Retro Replay, Final Cartridge 3 or Action Replay for example, so whenever you switch on your computer, it will go into C64 mode automatically. So if I want to use my C128 in C64 mode to play some games, I just keep the virtual retro replay card inserted in my ultimate and when I switch on my computer I see the retro replay screen and I'm in C64 mode already automatically. With the ultimate and retro replay combination you already get a speed load solution for your 1541 disk drives and also emulated disk drives, so you don't need to buy anything else. You know different users prefer different speed load solutions, as I never had a C64 back in the days, I never was really diving into the topic, so for now I'm happy with what I got with my ultimate. You can use your 1541 Ultimate 2 and 2 Plus also in C128 and CPM mode, so it basically behaves like you would have connected an original Commodore 1541 disk drive as an external drive on your computer in all three modes of the C128. Next let's have a look at some video cables, please don't expect an overview of all solutions available, that's a complicated topic and it is also quite different for PAL and NTSC countries, especially when it comes to the 80 column video output. So long story short, if you want the best looking picture quality without wasting your time, just get the old original CRT monitors from Commodore, which were rebranded Philips or Magnavox monitors in most cases. What I got here is a cheap analog multi-standard LCD TV from the early 2000s, it can handle PAL, NTC and SECAM input and you get all analog input signals you need for your old home computers, including SCART, RGB and even VGA. It is also in 4 to 3 format as it should be, so the picture doesn't look stretched and distorted as on many modern monitors. Picture quality doesn't look as nice as on old CRT monitors, but at least that TV does not take much space. I will show you now which cables I use on my PAL C128 and my old LCD TV. This here is a cable for the 40 column output, which is also the video output for your C64 games. Whenever possible I get my cables from Retro Computer Shack. Ian, the gentleman behind that company, makes the best cables I've seen so far, they are even labeled properly, so when you own tons of cables like me, you still know then for which computer it was made. So this here is one of the best cables you can get for your original classic C64 and C128 computer when using 40 column video output. There is a SVHS component signal connector for the best video quality you can get for the 40 column output as there is no RGB out available there. If your TV or monitor cannot handle SVHS, you also get a composite video signal, of course, picture quality looks slightly worse then. There is also a Chinch or RCA connector for audio output. As I said before, the more modern version of the Commodore WIC graphic chip creates stripes on the screen, but this has nothing to do with the video cable. Unfortunately, I've not seen any 80 column C128 cable made by Retro Computer Shack. 
Now let's have a closer look at the Ethicalum video output. This is a digital RGB output similar to CGE from back in the days for old PCs. You will only remember that in case you're old enough and you can get up to 16 colors out of such a solution. As I said, the best option would be to use an old original Commodore monitor for that, but if you need to connect it now to a more modern monitor, there are basically two main approaches. Either you convert it kind of RGB signal to a RGB card or to VGA and use that with a VGA monitor that can also handle 15 kHz signals or you use an additional scan doubler. The RGB SCART approach is more suitable for Europe as you still can find TVs and monitors having such a connector there. The VGA approach will be more interesting for Commodore fans in the US, I guess. So far I've not gone the VGA route, even I've seen on eBay and other places that you can buy converters for that. As I live in Europe and I own several monitors that can handle SCART RGB input, I bought a SCART converter cable from eBay. It works and does the job, but there's also information available on the web how to build something like that yourself. By the way, you don't get only 80 column text mode, but also high resolution graphics using 16 colors. The later C128 DCR model can even use 64 kilobytes of graphic memory. Older C128 versions had only 16 kilobytes video RAM available. So the graphic capabilities of that VDC chip came already close to what you could do with later Mega computers, but not many programs really made use of that unfortunately. Before I show you now my SCART cable I got from eBay, here are two cables I got from the web store RetroCable.de from Germany. One has a switch on the RGB plug to switch between 40 and 80 column output, but it supports only one of the 16 colors available, so the 80 column output is only black and white. The other cable supports 8 of the 16 colors, but you cannot switch between 40 and 80 column output, so both cables are quite limited if you want to switch back and forth between 40 and 80 color mode, and also if you want to play around with the few colorful demos and homebrew games available, so they would be only interesting for a limited target group, I guess. Here now the cable I got from eBay from a seller from Italy. With that you can switch between composite video and 80 color RGB mode on your SCART connector and all 16 colors are supported. I use this cable only when I want to play around with the 80 color mode. For the 40 color mode the picture quality is better with the first cable I did show you from Retro Computer Shack. I only show you a few examples now of C128 programs supporting the 80 color mode. There are not really that many games and demos around. Still, I find it pretty cool what you can do with that machine. So, how to switch to 80 color mode? You need to press down the 4080 display key on your keyboard and as you use only one monitor, I also need to switch my converter's card cable to 80 color mode. As I don't use two separate monitors and as I don't own a working Commodore monitor that can handle both modes, it gets a bit complicated for me when using the Ultimate 2 in C128 80 color mode. The Ultimate 2 supports also C64 cards like Action Replay and others, so first you need to disable such cards on your Ultimate, otherwise the computer would always boot up in C64 mode automatically. The Ultimate 2, on which I stored also all my C128 and CPM programs, only provides a user interface for the 40 color mode, so you always need to start in 40 color mode first, mount the disk in the Ultimate 2 user interface, press down the 4080 display key, switch on the cable to 80 color mode, reboot the computer and load the C128 program with 80 color support. Of course, I could also use the internal disk drive instead, but I would never find my disks when I would need them. Please don't expect to see all 80 column programs available. There is a Burger Time and also Space Invaders clone available, for example, and you can also watch a slideshow in 16 colors high resolution, which takes ages to load from my Ultimate.
Next, let's have a quick look at the CPM functionality of the C128. On all C128 models, you have the possibility to use your computer in CPM 3.0 mode. And the way to start CPM is that you boot up your computer with a CPM disk. The C128 has even an additional separate Z80 CPU built-in that is used just for that mode. So it is like a computer within your computer. CPM Plus 3.0 is a multi-platform operating system made by Digital Research. The idea was that you can use more professional CPM office software, like for example word processing, on your C128. You can also use both the 40 and 80 color mode, but of course for more professional software 80 color mode should be used. The idea that you can use your computer for professional CPM software did look good on paper, but it was just too little too late. There were several problems with that. First of all, people didn't even know where to get such software. Then also most Commodore 128 users did get only 1541 disk drives with their computer, which are slower than later 1571 versions. So using CPM with 1541 disk drives is painfully slow. There is no hard drive within the C128, so I think you would need even two faster 1571 disk drives to really work with the computer in CPM mode. Another issue was that many people that wanted to run Office software already moved on to the CPM competitor MS-DOS. Playing around with CPM on a C128 today can be a fun activity for home computer enthusiasts, but you would need the Commodore CPM manual. You can find it on eBay or you can find also scanned versions for download. Here you see the German manuals for the computer and there is a separate handbook for CPM. All the original Commodore CPM boot disks I've seen so far are single-sided disks for 1541 drives. So you have to flip over the disk in case you need one of the commands stored on the second side of the disk. My C128 DCR has a later 1571 drive built-in, which can also handle double-sided disks. So I did copy over all the CPM files on a double-sided disk, so you can keep the CPM boot disk in your drive and all the commands you need are available on the boot disk. There is a guy selling such double-sided CPM boot disks on eBay, but you can make one yourself and it is explained in the CPM manual how to do that. Now you might ask why I even use a real CPM boot disk if I have the ultimate 2 plugged in at the back. Well, the ultimate simulates an older 1541 disk drive, therefore it is slower than my real 1571, but at least the ultimate also works in CPM mode and I can use it as a second drive and I can start CPM programs from there, even if it is quite slow. There are a few CPM programs and even CPM homebrew games available. Usually they look less interesting than C64 games, but still it is fun playing around with the CPM mode. One example I show you here is a classic text adventure game called Sorg. I found a disk image for this CPM version on the web. There would be more to tell you about CPM on the C128, but I only want to focus on the most important things here, otherwise this video would get too long. We already had a look at Homebrew 80 column games, next let's have a quick look at other programs that use C128 features. There are a few C64 games, you start in C64 mode as usual, and those games can use the faster CPU of the C128 in C64 mode. One example is Uridium Plus, you see on the start menu that the faster CPU was detected. I will not show you now all of those programs, but here another example, Grand Prix Circuit. That racing game runs a bit faster on the C128.
Next, let's have a quick look at one of the few real commercial C128 titles available. This is the Rocky Horror Show. If you are younger than me, you might never heard of the Rocky Horror Picture Show movie from 1975. Go and check it out. Maybe you like the music and the whole weird setup. Anyway, the C128 game version has redrawn graphics and looks different to the C64 version. Still, I guess that game is only interesting for fans of the movie. At the end of this video I want to show you two great homebrew ports of Sync and Spectrum games. You can get also C64 versions of those games, but what makes them special is that you also get C128 versions that make use of the VDC RGB video output. So as long as you have a proper AT color monitor or a proper video cable or video converter box, you get a great looking picture signal and a fun spectrum title in which you are a sheriff in an isometric adventure. Go and download that game, find the link below. If you did like the game Gunfright, then you should also download Pentagram, which is another ZX Spectrum isometric adventure game conversion and there you also get VDC support. You know I'm also a ZX Spectrum fan and I like the old 3D and isometric games from back in the days, so it is great to see those games now also on Commodore machines. So I hope you did enjoy this video and I hope it was not too long for you. I really like the look of my C128 DCR. It looks like a C64 gaming PC. It is a machine from the end of the 8-bit era with lots of possibilities for classic home computer fans. You get three computers in one, you can even play around with CPM and you still can play great old C64 games. If you are thinking about getting such a computer, keep in mind there is work to do if you want more than just having another museum piece standing around and you really want to use your computer. Most of the modifications I've shown in this video were already done in 2017, so if you want to modify your C128 DCR, always check first if there are now already easier and smarter ways for modding available, especially when it comes to the drive address switch mod. You know, making videos is a lot of work and very time consuming and as this is a non-commercial hobby activity, this is a free service for you. So please consider subscribing to my channel to show your support. You will find a lot of interesting stuff here you have not seen on million other YouTube channels before. Please like, share and feel free to leave a comment and as always, thanks for watching.